You're listening to Death of the Reader, Flex and Herds here for your Murder Mystery World Tour, and we are in our one and a half th- week, our second week 1.5. of covering the mysterious case of the Alphas and Angels by Janice Hallett, but that is not what we're here to talk about today. Yeah, we're going to be chatting with the ever-famous Ben Hobson about the death of John Lacey, which we featured on the show last week, and we had such a good time chatting about it, uh, and it aligns quite well with the sort of structure of the Alberton Angels, uh, we decided to have him on again. <laughs> yeah, so. there'll be there'll be a couple of things that you've heard bits and pieces of in last week's show, but we'll be getting much deeper into the weird structural oddities and the flavor of evil that lies under the surface of John Lacey. Now, I guess the other thing that we did want to touch on, Herds, is that there's going to be a podcast-exclusive episode of this with some spoilers in tow, but there are also some interesting parallels in that section that might be worth going and checking out if you're so inclined. Yeah, I think in particularly the religious aspects of both novels, uh, with the, the cult of, of Alberton Angels and the uh, sort, of, sort of Australian Christian aspects of Ben Hobson's work. And it'll be interesting to kind of talk about how those two kind of coexist uh, in, in our, in our liter- literature brains. We'll be back with more of Janice Hallett's The Mysterious Case of the Alberton Angels next week on the show. But in the meantime, enjoy this and take a nice breather to read what is a very dense book in Alberton Angels. Read it deep. Read it deep. Indeed. We're going to throw over to Ben Hobson right now. This is your Murder Mystery World Tour here on 2SER 107.3. What the hell is going on here? 2SER's weekly email newsletter is your guide to everything that's happening at 2SER. I'd buy that for a dollar. It's your chance to win exclusive prizes, links to on-demand highlights, and to find out what's coming up on your favourite radio station. That is so fetch. Sign up to 2SER's weekly newsletter now at 2SER.com. Oh, oh, I'm convinced. You're listening to Death of the reader we are humbled today to be joined by ben hobson he's an english and music teacher author of to become a whale snake island host of words and nerds spin-off burgers beer and books and most recently the author of the death of john lacey an aussie historical crime fiction story set in the wild outback ben welcome to the show it's wonderful to have you here thank you so much i am extremely pleased to be here um currently on the road uh so for people listening i am in a little motel room in casino which is the beef capital of australia and it's very uh, exciting. I'm very excited. I'm. This is the second day of the tour, and can I say to you guys, I'm already feeling a little lonely. Oh no! <laughs> <laughs> I'm used. I'm used to having my pets and my my children and my wife and things like that. So it's always very noisy. So just to have quiet, it's very strange. My my mind doesn't know what to do with it anymore. I always say that, that it's so important to have a good v- villain, regardless of whether John Lacey is the, the the protagonist or the deuteragonist, however we want to classify him. Like he is the, mm. the bad guy. Because then the the good guys, the heroes of the story, can can shine even brighter. You know, you got that that mm. balance there. Now, in in your novel, so many of the the family oriented relationships. You know, there's a lot of brothers and and wives and fathers. Uh, a lot of these relationships are uh, toxic at best. Mm-hmm. What, why is it important that we look to bonds outside of our blood relations, or maybe complementary to those relations, in order to overcome adversity? <sighs> You like big questions, Ben? We got plenty more. No, this is good, man. Like, oh my gosh. Flex, Flex, I I will say Flex won't rewrite too many of the questions, I think, or or more than usually would. No, these are great questions. So, sorry, to to sum up your your question was really about how when we're in, uh, we can't really choose the people that we're related to and who we're born into family situations with, but we can choose who we align with outside of family Um, and why I I think that's important. Um, can I be completely real with you? I don't know whether I do think that's important. Sometimes I sometimes I really feel like in fiction, it's it's very difficult to capture a kind of messy um, relationship with family without it feeling very toxic. Um, I just think when we're reading, it's very heightened. And I certainly don't think that all relationships are toxic, but I just think that everyone's capable of making errors and making mistakes given their backgrounds. I try to have empathy for all the people in my stories, especially, which, um, you know, I've had a few reviews that say they're just very dark, my books, but I really don't ever feel like I look at, look at my characters with a sort of a judgmental eye. I always feel like 
I have some degree of, maybe not John Lacey, but <laughs> beyond him, I always feel like a degree of empathy for the characters. So a character like Ernst, I think, I think his relationship with Joe is kind of the most important part of who he is. Um, I think that he, his, his, his united brotherhood with Joe, I think that's what gives him strength. And in the end, you know, not to give too many things away, I think that's the thing that really powers him through to make a good choice. Um, to, well, again, it's all shades of morality, isn't it? It's a, a good yeah. choice given the circumstances. They're all trying to make the best decisions that they can. Like I personally, I really enjoy the the opening chapters with the, the Montague family because mm. You kind of you present uh, the the mother Isabella as kind of the bad guy at, at first. Let me be very clear. At first, she's kind of the bad guy. She's irrational. She's racist, and the yeah. father is a bit more understanding. But then you find out why he's so understanding of the indigenous tribe that lives just over the hill that he seems to be visiting frequently, and why she's so afraid of them. And yeah, you know, she, they're all very tragic characters, right? And that's where yeah. that kind of moral dubiousness comes from. I felt. Yeah, definitely. And it was, you know, and she was very difficult to write because it was from Ernst's perspective. So I certainly didn't want her to write her as just a a victim and just a one note shrilling sort of shouty kind of character. So it was important to show that she was feeling trapped herself. A lot of the people in the book, I think, who have any degree of say over or choice over their lives tend to be the men in the book. The white men in the book tend to be the only ones who get to say, um, I choose to do this, like they have a type of agency, whereas a lot of the other characters, I think, get their their idea of what they'd like to do just robbed from them without any of their say, which is, you know, very sadly true for a lot of relationships around the world, right? Um, that being said, though, you know, I did try to paint Edwin with a little degree of empathy. I don't know whether I was – I don't know what I feel about that, man. Um, to yeah. me, when, when – well – when I'm writing, it's to me, it's me really thinking about what I think about these people. You know, I've never tried to judge. Like I said, I just don't like books where the the characters are being judged. It just feels very mustache twirly. Yeah, well, I think one of the interesting things that you've sort of done in answering this question is kind of deal with something that Herds and I were talking about earlier this week. The idea that authors have to have opinions that they have to share with people uh when when <laughs> they sort of ask these sorts of questions whereas the thing that i really like that you've done here is that you've said all right well here's your question and here's the question that i'm asking to deal with that question <laughs> yeah and i really i live really love that way of like framing the idea and also how like parallel that is to some of the things in the book like for example a lot of those familial bonds that we're talking about are very enabling of destruction or an excuse for an, an enabling of destruction yeah and it was interesting to me that the book is sort of framed around being a book about brotherhood when normally you might expect to be about the importance of family values, whereas I guess you're more angling towards that question of, okay, what does that mean? Yeah. Yeah, it's a good point, man. Like I, I often think about my books that way. I often think when, <laughs> when I'm writing, sometimes I'm, not, I'm doing my best to not think. Mm. Um, which sounds terrible, and please don't put that as a sound bite or something somewhere. Where I, <laughs> I think we're contractually <laughs> obligated to. Uh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> no, it's like I'm always trying to get out of my own way, and I feel like a lot of the time when I have written from a place of trying to put on my deepest thoughts into a thing and really investigate a thing with all the ways that I think about a subject – it just comes out labored and gross and I'm trying to put on airs, like I'm trying to use fancy words where simple words would do. The way I write it is much more, I try to, and I, this is the way I think about it now, I'm trying to improvise and it's much more like I'm wearing each of the characters and it's just me sort of trying to act it out and it's like I'm just seeing it unfold. And if I can get to the place where these characters are acting in a way that feels very natural, I don't certainly don't think they're, you know, separate from me they're all extensions from me but it's me trying to to feel the way the characters would would feel and act in a naturalistic way so that's where I get to that point where I'm not trying to certainly not say things about the characters I think there's some deep ideas in this book I think um towards the later section especially Gilbert is one who um does a lot of the thinking and he's sort of stuck in a in a in a position like this so to me he's sort of the one where I put a lot of thought into you know framing um those sort of conflicts within him 
a lot of the time it's just me watching these people act and um, without judgment. And I think readers are the people who should be thinking about these things, right? And that's not my job. I, my job is to get out of my own way and present a story. And I just, you know, I don't like books that are very didactic and tries to I just feel one note, you know, and just yeah. I feel like, uh, you know, if, I, if you're telling me to not like this character, I'm always in the background going like, oh, I don't like being told not to like someone like or the or the opposite where SS Van Dyne comes along and insists that his main character is likable and you're like no that is the most punchable person I've ever read. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it's sort of it's really special about writing man and reading is so many takes. Like I I remember writing um my very first book which is To Become a Whale which is this this little kid he's very sensitive and he has a father, again, talking about toxic related. The father's trying his best, but he's a 1960s dad who is a whaler. So he's, he's not the most kind man, if you know what I mean. I went to a book club once and this, this man sat across from me and he just said, I don't understand why you wrote such a pussy. <laughs> I'm like, oh, okay. And he's like, he's just a wimp. Why doesn't he just, why doesn't he just stand up to his father? I'm like, oh, okay. So... It was such an interesting thing for me because I was like, ah, oh, you've, when people read and then they, they have their thoughts on it, it's much more to me a comment on, on them than it is on the person writing the book. It's kind of special. Everyone reads it their own way, you know? It's a bit telling then if you, you were talking about how qu- quite a few people come away from this book thinking it's quite dark. And honestly, I, I definitely had the same impression. I, I do acknowledge that there's these shades of gray and you know we're, we're writing real people but mm. that was definitely my initial reaction mm. um now in, in crime fiction we often name money riches as the least interesting motivator for murder uh mm-hmm. in john lacy we see the title character motivated mainly by gold but it's framed yes. by his desire to be better than his father and this is something that the montague brothers can relate to how do the familiar bonds in, in your narrative elevate the primal drive that many of these protagonists share, the drive to be rich? You know what? Like, can I be real? That never entered my mind. I, just when I was writing um, John Lacey, he, was, he had a brother and he just appeared as on these, you know, the first little sentence as they're riding on horseback into the town was just this brother relationship. Um, I think there's a different sort of because there's two sets of brothers. I think the first set of brothers, I think Ernst is less smart than John Lacey. I think he's not a very bright man in a lot of different ways. He's very desperate and he ends up being quite a violent person, quite, what's the word I'm looking for, impulsive, which ends up being quite destructive to his relationship with his brother Joe, which I find very interesting too. I feel like his love is a bit more honest because it's less studied, like it's less manipulated, like he's just purely himself with his brother. So, yeah, to me, those two are just desperate to survive. But John Lacey, I think the only person in the world he cares about is his brother because that's the last person he has left. But I don't think he's motivated to help Gray. I think I think in his mind he's sort of, he wants to help Gray become who Gray wants to be, but he also want, doesn't want what Gray wants. Gray sort of is much more of a, uh, he wants a home, he wants a family, he wants, you know, he wants this familiar type of Australian life. Uh, mm-hmm. Whereas he wants John stability, Lacey, right? Yeah. John Lacey's sort of, there's something in him that just doesn't seem quite there, which he seems proud of as well. Like he's not like the rest of these people running around desperate. He knows what he's going to do. For me, it's like Grey is the last little vestige of kind of a, a compass, a moral compass for John Lacey, but throughout his journey sort of slowly pushes him aside a little bit, which is a bit heartbreaking. There's an implication, I, I believe Dell mentions, shout out to Dell, best character. Uh, you like Dell, I like Dell, yeah. <laughs> I, I really, I really, <laughs> you did him dirty. <laughs> he went out in a, a blaze of glory, yeah, but you yeah, did true. him so dirty, I loved it. <laughs> But um, Dell says that uh, I, I think it's Dell says that Gray probably knows what you're up to, John, uh, and and you know I want in too, and so there's that sense, and this is maybe what I was leading on earlier that um, Gray knows that there's like a, a darkness within John, there's there's something bad there, and you know we we cut to ten twenty years later or whatever, and and Gray still has done nothing. 
Grey has done nothing to stop it's John from building this criminal let him empire. Go on, yeah. Yeah, I, I guess I'm curious about why Grey didn't step in if he is that that compass. Mm. Is it is it like fear of his brother? Is it that want for stability? Doesn't want. It's to a good question, man. Boat? I mean, it, that was actually very deliberate. Um, that was actually there's a chapter that I actually added in later on as I wanted it to be clear enough where they're sitting by a fire and they're they're watching um, the First Nations people sort of dance over in the distance and Grey mentions, you know, we need to treat these people as human beings and anyone who does anything wrong to them, like they're just the worst sort of person, you can never trust them. And why is he talking about that? You know, why is he saying that to his brother? Like I think he very clearly knows, if not explicitly what's happening, he definitely knows something has is going on with his brother. And your question is why doesn't he step in? Why doesn't he actually change his brother's mind? Well, I guess my question would be like, would you? Because there's, <laughs> I have a brother, and you don't know, right? I have a brother. You know, we're all we're we're adult men now, and so he makes choices. And you know, I don't always agree with everything he does with his own life. Like, if I had a choice, I would, you know, force him to maybe do something a little bit differently. But he's his own person too, and you know, there's little degrees, right? And with all human relationships, you just let that little thing go. And then, oh, this other little thing, you let that go. And then so on and so forth. I just think it's, I don't know. I don't know whether he would have said is something. Would you have said something? You hope so, right? I hope that I would do the right thing, whatever the right thing is, right? I mean, <laughs> what, we, a po- we what a political answer. <laughs> <laughs> there is no other answer I can give. No, but like, we, we, like- we covered... Gray is yeah. like he's got a he's got his prospective wife like he's got this business. Imagine he were to tear down his brother like he'd lose a lot of the things that he really wants for his life. I mean, he's kind of maybe selfishly motivated. Maybe it's just too too much conflict. Maybe he doesn't think about it as a question as to whether he should do something. I don't know. I don't know why he doesn't, but um, I think he should do something. But. I don't know whether I'd do anything different. If I'm being completely honest, I would want to hope I would, but I've never been in that sort of desperate situation thinking about all the factors that um, Gray yeah, has. In- I, I think it's also maybe that the three of us who deal with words a lot would really hope that our explanation of our concerns would be enough to sway them to make the choice that we want them to make, maybe. Is that... Yeah, have they? I mean, I'm sure there have been disagreements in your life with people who you love. You've probably had people in your life who you love, who have made choices where you're like, oh, why are you yeah. listening to that particular person speak on that particular issue? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I think the political atmosphere of our world in the last 10 years, there's been a lot of times where I've wanted to say to people who I really love, like, are you, sh- are you sure? <laughs> <laughs> and then sometimes I do, and then it always ends up in a fight and it always ends up with argument and you always feel mm. gross, but you should. Can I, can I tell you a, a personal anecdote? Yeah, know, on the show, which terrible. is a terrible thing to do as a professional. Why, radio Why is that bad? Man. No, it's That's too late. <laughs> I'm I'm joking. But oh, okay, cool. <laughs> I, I I remember, and I I don't remember the name of of the politician, but my mother, you know, she was sending me. This is during the um, the, the the Black Lives Matter movement, so it was a pretty big issue at the time. And you know, she was sending me an article about the the, the victim who who sparked the whole the whole thing. And how he was a criminal and how, you know, even if there should be this movement, it shouldn't be on the back of this particular human being. Yeah. And I did some research about the politician who who had written this article. Mm-hmm. And I said, Mom, this person has been on every side of the political spectrum. They're known for these, this, this, and this controversy. They're getting their sources from these other people who are also known to be hacks. And she said, oh, I didn't know any of that. And I was like, yeah, you didn't because <laughs> you didn't like research, you know. And and those sorts of conflicts, it's difficult to to tangle with. I think I think that's one of the fun things about the way that their relationship is portrayed in the book is that like it sort of makes you yearn for that action, and that is a part of reading the text differently for each person. Is what what action do you yearn for in their inaction? Mm, that's well put. Um, yeah, you do. You want Gray to take a step. You want him. You want him to take a chain and wrap it around Lacey's neck, and then just lash him to a tree somewhere, right, and just say, hey. <laughs> You stay in here until we figure out what the heck is wrong in you to make you do all these horrible things. It would be nice. It would have changed the course of the whole novel. Um, you kind of want Grey to do that. 
But again, we're fallible human beings. I just, you know, it's just the way it goes sometimes, unfortunately, I think. I guess I, I wanted to ask about, uh, about kind of the structure of your writing. Mm. Um, you've made some particularly bold choices here. The way that you you title the acts of your story in particular, mm-hmm. they're reminiscent of some of my favorite Western movies, like uh, 310 to Yuma or The Good and the Bad and the Ugly, where the mm. titles kind of, they kind of give away what's going to happen by the end of the story, but are not yeah. uh, descriptive of what the, the act will be about. Um, my favorite example of this is The Wide and Destructive Path of Gilbert Delaney. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then the first couple of chapters is him just like, I'm just a guy with my family having a, having a great time and being a lovely human being. You don't know how it's going to connect with the end. Yeah. Um, could, could you tell me how you built up the confidence to spoil the ending of your book on the title cover? <laughs> oh, man. Um, yeah, there's lots of probably different things. You'll have to rein me in if I go off on tangents with this. Too late for that. It was okay. It was not <laughs> not the original title. The original title was just Lacey. It was just going to be big Lacey written over the front of it. But in discussions with my agent, who is long-suffering, but I never get a title past her. So every single book I've written, I've said, oh, this is the title. And I've always wanted to get one by her. But I I thought this one, Lacey, like it's punchy. It's got, you know, big letters. It could be really cool. Book about lingerie. That is exactly (laughs) what she said. (laughs) <laughs> she said it sounds like it's going to be a romance, period romance sort of thing, maybe like doilies or something like that. So then I took, because the first chapter was already called The Death of John Lacey, so I took that and gave that away right up front. But then starting with his death, uh, I guess it was a little bit of my way of saying it's a, he does die. You know, this this horrible part of our history, he is dead at the beginning. I wanted it to be a kind of inevitability. But, yeah, the structure of the story was really interesting. I started out writing uh, the the John Lacey section, so the conquest of John Lacey where he, he he's sort of his rise to power in the gold fields of Ballarat. And then after that I thought, well, this is the most evil person I've ever written. And at the moment I'd written that, it was just going to be that. and It was going to be maybe a novella or something. But I thought that is that's very dark and like not a nice place to be in. And I wanted to see if I could have some characters in the same sort of situation as, as John Lacey, but people who were standing up to him. But when I was writing it, I had no idea what the structure would be. I toyed once with shifting timelines. I don't know whether you've seen the movie Dunkirk. Do you remember that? So I was trying to, inter- it just was very confusing. So I ended up just presenting it in the most straightforward manner, which is just in order, mostly in order of um, the timeline. Then starting with... Um, John Lacey's death and you wondering what had gone on to get him into that uh, circumstance. Yeah, I guess like one of the things that I talk about often with thrillers is like the flavor of the page turner. What is that element that gets you turning the page? And I think that there's there's kind of two mm. in this book. There's one is the sort of destructive inevitability that those chapter titles give you where you're like, okay, Gilbert Delaney, if, if you insist as you get further and further towards the <laughs> destructive path. But the other one is the sort of pacing that's lent by your choice to omit quotations for speech. Mm. It's also like if it's the first time you've come across this particular style, it's kind of threatening too. Mm. Where you're like, oh, how how am I supposed to read this? You kind of have to figure it out, even though on some level you do know. Yeah, did you? I'm actually interested because my job would be, and the thing I set out to do is if without quotation marks, you should still not have trouble figuring out who's speaking and when. So it was a real mission to actually make sure it was okay. It still flowed the way I needed to flow. It shouldn't stop people from enjoying the book. I was in a band a long time ago and I used to play, it was like a punk ska band and I played a five string bass. Somehow it does not surprise me in any way that a punk ska bass player wrote this book. <laughs> really? Okay. I'm, good. I'm on brand. I'm on brand. Um, but I used to use that fifth string as a kind of easy crutch. It was easy. So when it was heavy, I would just play the bottom B string. And then um, my guitarist said, uh, you've got this beautiful Fender Jazz over here. It's a four string. Can you change all the songs so it would be fitting on the four string? And so I had to restrict myself. And it actually, I think, made me more creative and more the songs more interesting and the sound was better. So I've always thought about that, you know. If you can restrict yourself in doing something, you know, what can be produced by having less you know, what sort of creative sort of ideas can you have with less? Um, so there's a little bit of that. It's too. so interesting to think of like speech marks as something that you could take out to have less because really it doesn't 
change that much about the text, but you still have to work around it in a way. Yeah, it re- yeah, it's restrictive. And you do have to be very careful about, okay, well, I really do need to make sure I say he said here the little dialogue tags, otherwise people's flow will be interrupted. It's easier with quotation marks to keep people's, keep who's speaking very clear. Without them, you do have to be really, it makes you think, it forces you to think, I think, more yeah, thoroughly definitely. through what you're writing, yeah. So we're, we're talking about all this this cool grammar stuff. I, I really wanted to say that when you described your language as blunt, uh, that's the term that I want to use when describing your text, but I thought it would be too rude, so I'm glad that you said it first. I think it's <laughs> fine. Like, it just... It's just hitting a nail with a hammer. Like it's, I don't. I completely agree. I don't want to try to get that nail in there any other way. Like there's just, there's a way you got to speak. Sometimes you'll be blunt. It's just the way I like to read and the way I like to. Um, no, I agree. Right. I, I think that partic- particularly talking about how you've, you've removed all the he said, she said, which means that you don't have to spend time defining exactly what's going on. Um, but there, there is another crassness that I wanted to address with you because I noticed while thumbing through the novel that there are quite a few times when a character farting is used to show how comfortable they are with present company, that they can let their guard down. Now, I Edwin love this. Farts- this is my, one of my favorite interviews ever, by the way. Let's keep going. Edwin, great. Hold on. I'm so not done asking the question. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Edwin farts in the First Nations camp in the first act. Uh, Gray farts with his brother in the second how did letting one loose become the universal language of ease in the death of John Lacey? I love this so much. There's so much about this. All right, I need to talk. This is going to be a nine-hour podcast now. Um, Sign me up. All right. So the first part was that when I was in 2004, so I would have been 20 years old, I watched a film called Shaun of the Dead, Um, one of my favorite films. I went and saw it in the cinema it was huge. It was the start of the Cornetto trilogy. I love that series and I love that film especially. But there is a scene right at the start, I don't know whether you remember, where it's uh, Nick Frost's character farts and it's this moment of intimacy between the two. And then later on as he's turning into a zombie and he's saying goodbye, they bring that same little exchange up. And he turned, and it was in the commentary track, I remember Simon Pegg talking about it, they wanted to turn a fart into this sentimental, sweet like it might bring tears to people's eyes, but it's still a, a fart. I found that amazing. So I always had that in the back of my mind. And then there was a, an exchange between Edwin and Ernst. Um, Ernst is his son. So Edwin is describing how he loves um, his Wadarung mistress, but he doesn't love his own wife. And he was just saying it as bluntly as that. I love this one. I don't love this one. And it was actually an early reader who picked that up and said, that's a bit lazy. Like I'm just telling something to the audience. It's a little lazy. So it was up to me to go and think about how can I show that Edwin feels more physically comfortable with one relationship than with the other? How do I show that strain? And it just delighted me so much to think of that fart and to bring that back as this. I'm so glad you picked that up. Um, When you put these little things in, you never know whether readers will actually – find those little parts but that you notice that so it makes my heart real warm man like i'm just so happy yeah Yeah. i'm sure i'm not the only person so you've made us very happy us fart lovers you know (laughs) we're just (laughs) it's fun though to to turn this to turn yeah like you say it is an intimate thing like who do you feel comfortable around to pass wind in front of and it's kind of crass just made me laugh i don't know (laughs) yeah but yeah, I uh, just, yeah, I really love that you picked that up. No, fair enough. All right. Well, I suppose we should uh, wrap wrap this up. Ben, it has been an absolute treat having you on the show, and The Death of John Lacey has been an amazing read to kick off 2023. So thank you so much for putting in all the work on this book and sitting down to chat about it with us. Oh, it's, a, it's been a pleasure, man. You guys have some awesome questions, hey? Like, i got to lift my game as an interviewer, <laughs> I think. Like, you make all these links and... It's been awesome. I really appreciate you guys. No worries. I mean, listen, I love listening to uh, Burgers Beard books on Words and Nerds. <laughs> so, like, it's really, really fun getting to turn the tables on you here. Yeah, well, appreciate it, man. You've done you've done your work. I feel exhausted now. I had to think so hard. <laughs> I'm going to go have a sleep, I think. <laughs> <laughs>
that's what we're going for. So it's, it's all working out. <laughs> Very good. All righty. We are talking with author Ben Hobson about his latest novel, The Death of John Lacey, which is out with Alan and Unwin here in Australia. Thanks to them and ABC Radio National's The Bookshelf for linking Herds and me up with copies. This is your Murder Mystery World Tour here on 2SER 107.3. We'll catch you around. Stay tuned. <laughs>